Hello, everyone. I'm Gloria Blackwell, AAUW's Chief Executive Officer, and welcome to today's webinar, Leave No One Behind, Combating Global Human Trafficking. We're very excited to have you with us today to talk about this incredibly important topic. Uh, just a few housekeeping reminders. I wanted to let you know that we are recording the webinar and it will be available on the AAUW website at aauw.org. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box if you have any questions for the AUW team of a technical nature. Our trustee AUW staff is supporting this webinar. I want to thank uh, those of you who submitted questions beforehand for the webinar. Um, they are, some of them are definitely incorporated into our conversation this afternoon. Uh, and we're going to get ready to go ahead and start. So thank you. Um, so let us get started. In the past decade, human trafficking has emerged as one of the fastest growing criminal activities in the world. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime defines human trafficking as, quote, the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of people through force, fraud, or deception with the aim of exploiting them for profit. This modern day and form of enslavement claims an estimated 27.6 million victims of all ages around the world and is a serious violation of human rights. Though human trafficking affects people across different backgrounds and in all areas of the world, women and girls are disproportionately impacted. And it's important to also point out that is, it is reported that 40% of sex trafficking victims in the United States are Black, despite Black people making up only 13.6% of the U.S. population. This significant statistics points to a disturbing trend of disproportionate racial discrimination in sex trafficking in our country. As strongly stated in AAUW's public policy priorities, AAUW believes that global interdependence requires national and international policies against human trafficking and that promote peace, justice, human rights, sustainable development, and mutual security for all people. July 30th marks the UN World Day Against Trafficking in Persons to raise awareness and strengthen global efforts for the prevention and the elimination of human trafficking. This year's theme, quote, reach every victim of trafficking, leave no one behind, end quote, centers survivors in these efforts. Though awareness and concern around this industry have grown in recent years, human trafficking is consistently underreported due to its covert nature, low community awareness, lack of law enforcement, limited resources for victim recovery, and the social blaming of victims. For today's conversation, we're joined by an expert fellowships and grants alumna from the AAUW to discuss her work to combat human trafficking around the world. Dr. Laura A. Dean is an Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Human Trafficking Research Lab at Millican University in Illinois and the 2016-17 AAUW American Fellowships recipient. She received her PhD in Political Science from the University of Kansas and a Master of Arts in International Studies focusing on Russian, East European and Central Asian Studies from the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. Dr. Dean researches gender and politics issues, focusing on women's representation, public policy, migration, and gender-based violence in Eurasia. Her book, Diffusing Human Trafficking Policy in Eurasia was published by Policy Press at the University of Bristol in May of 2020. Dr. Dean is currently conducting research on trafficking in war with a focus on Ukraine, which is very timely. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Dean. Thanks Hello. For Hello, Laura. I'm really glad that you are joining us today for this important conversation. So we'll just start off by asking that 
Can you tell us more about the work of the Human Trafficking Research Lab at Millikan University and, and what roles research laboratories play in combating human trafficking um, from the local to the global level? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So I started my human trafficking research lab in 2018. Um, I work at a very teaching centered institution. And so I kind of saw it as a way to integrate undergraduate students in my research. Um, but as you heard in my bio, I don't research the United States. And sadly, um, many students don't speak the languages from the region that I study. And so I kind of started the lab in a way to get students involved, but also to learn more about human trafficking in the United States. And I'm really focusing on Illinois, which is where I'm located. Um, so, so I established the lab to look at more localized issues, and then we became a member of the Central Illinois Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, so there are task forces and groups around the country and around the world that collaborate. They are, you know, uh, policing agencies, local victim services agencies, educators, researchers like me, social workers, um, everyone who's kind of interested in human trafficking, and they come together to be able to work on uh, these issues. And so uh, I started my lab and then we joined the Central Illinois Human Trafficking Task Force in order to kind of learn more about the issue um, hands on and kind of get some more applied research. We also, so my students and I do all the research for the task force. Um, and so we run, there's a research subcommittee. And so my students and I are the ones that uh, run it. And we collect and analyze data on human trafficking. We look at training data. So we identify where trainings have occurred for police, for educators, for social workers. And then we identify gaps in our region. Um, so our region of Illinois is 46 different counties. So we have a large geographic area. And so we're able to locate kind of describe discrepancies on where in this county we didn't uh, conduct any training. So clearly we need to get out there and talk to police or we need to get out there and talk to social workers. And then we also work with local organizations to develop screening tools for trafficking victims so they're able to identify them. Um, and we, one of our most current projects is actually looking at the adjudication of cases. So we found by sitting on the task force that a lot of prosecutors and police often don't charge human trafficking as human trafficking. They'll charge it for a lower statute, like pimping or prostitution or child pornography, when it actually could be charged as trafficking. And the reason that they do that is because the lower statu statutes are easier to get a conviction. And so we kind of learned that by sitting on the task force. And my students said, well, I guess we should do some research on it. <laughs> and then I said, OK. So we basically uh, looked at a decade's worth of arrest data in 15 counties in central Illinois. And we found hundreds of cases that could have been charged as human trafficking. And so we kind of give this research informed approach to the problems and issues that we see um, on the task force. And I think that, you know, my hope is that we could have research labs all over the country focusing on trafficking. I think that they can play a vital role in providing local police, NGOs, and policymakers with data-informed research and practices on human trafficking, which, as you mentioned, is a phenomenon that is very, very difficult to research. But I think these data-informed practices from an academic perspective can offer so many opportunities for um, collaboration between academia and local practitioners, but also really interesting avenues for applied research. And as I said, most of our research ideas come from working with practitioners in the field. And so we have a front row seat really to um, the task force. And that helps us understand what's happening in our region and how we can better combat trafficking. Um, and then we use these ideas kind of as feedback loops. Um, to advise on best practices, formulate research, and detail specific processes that can improve reporting and adjudication in our state. Like we've realized that a lot of NGOs don't actually screen for human trafficking victims. They'll screen for other issues of gender-based violence. And so we're working with local organizations to be able to do that. Um, and I think for my students too, I work at an undergraduate teaching institution. It's a great opportunity for them to get hands-on research and applied research um, with professionals in the field where I think they're really welcomed as equals and respected for the research experience that they bring to the task force. Thank you so much. I mean, that was that was a great introduction. And I, I think that many folks, you know, aren't aware of the fact that you know, research does play a critical role in your connection to the actual practitioners and what that means. And also just introducing students, you know, to that research component, right, at, in such a critical stage. 
in their learning environment is also really, really important. That's, that's really great. And like you said, if only all of this could be happening in every state, right, we could certainly have more of an impact, um, you know, and an effect on, you know, combating human trafficking. Thanks. Um, and so, you know, within the lab and within your career over the past what, 20 years you've conducted extensive field work on trafficking and the exploitation of women in Latvia, Ukraine, and Russia. So talk a little bit about your field work and research and how, you know, field work on the ground can uh, inform a really strong anti-human trafficking policy. Yeah, thanks for that question. So um, I've been really fortunate, I think, to be able to spend years in the field researching this issue. Um, so I wanted to really start with kind of pointing out the privilege that I've had to be able to conduct the research that I do with support from AAUW and different U.S. government funded programs, which helped me learn the language. Um, I grew up as an English speaker. That is my native language and started learning languages when I was only 19 and basically have continued learning them for the rest of my life. Um, you know, and really supported by different types of language programs. And so the ability to learn the languages, history, and culture of the region that I study is an immense privilege, and I'm eternally grateful for that opportunity. Um, so the type of research that I do takes a significant amount of resources, and I think that I have been so fortunate to have had so much support during my education and field work. Um, so I want to make sure I point, yeah, point out the privilege that I have in conducting the research that I do. Um, so yeah, so it's, I think, actually on the ground research has been really vital to the work that I do. Um, before I started my PhD, I actually spent a year working at a trafficking shelter um, in Latvia. And so I came to academia kind of from a practitioner um, perspective, which I think lends a victim centered approach uh, to the research that I do, um, and the work that I do. And also it kind of informs this idea that I was able to learn from the people who worked with a lot of the policies that I studied about what worked and what didn't, and then help the, you know with them develop different recommendations to improve those policies. And so my research is very much informed by the voices of the people um, that work on the ground uh, you know, with this issue. So yeah, so I spent a year in Latvia as a Fulbright scholar. I spent another year in Ukraine um, where I was able to travel around to half of the regions. Um, I was there in 2012, 2013, so right before the revolution, which is such a unique time. And I'm, again, so grateful. Um, that was on a Rotary Fellowship. And then I spent three summers in Russia, um, basically witnessing the complete erasure of the anti-trafficking movement as the Russian government started cracking down on human trafficking uh, due to its links to the U.S. government. So because the U.S. government prioritizes this issue, the Russian government wants to deprioritize the issue and basically get rid of any sort of anti-trafficking organization that works to rehabilitate victims. Um, so the politicization of, of this issue on the ground, having people be afraid to meet with me as an American, especially people within the Russian government, was a very, very unique um, experience uh, to be able to kind of live through. Um, so through these interviews, I was able to center the voices of local people, including numerous survivors, so trafficking, many former survivors um, of trafficking start their own NGOs. Um, and so kind of, you know, centering those voices and being able to tell the stories of their challenges with public policy was such an interesting um, thing to be able to experience. And I'm thankful for all the people in the three different countries that gave me their time and shared their insight on trafficking. Um, a lot of these activists work with very few resources, some virtually nothing, um, and they work to help trafficking victims. And that's what really compelled me actually to write the book um, and what kept me going during the dark hours of writing a book on human trafficking, um, which is a difficult topic to research and write on. Um, I felt that I really wanted to have their stories told. They would often write to me and check in and say, when's your book coming out? And I would say, well, academic research takes time. Um, but yeah, so but wanting to kind of privilege and have their voices uh, told was something that was really important to me. And uh, due to the difficult political situations um, in in Russia, definitely in Ukraine, um, all of my interviews are anonymous uh, for their safety. But my research would have not would not have been possible without all of those people and their willingness to speak with me um, and share their stories, even when some random American woman showed up to like places in rural Ukraine. They were always willing to talk to me and I'm so thankful um, that I had that opportunity and that I was able to experience Ukraine um, before the war. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And I'm and I'm wondering before we move into some information about your book, um, how did the the those stories and having that experience, how did that impact your own mental health? You know, were there particular strategies that you had to put in place in order to make it through? Yeah, I mean, so that's one thing that I think working at an NGO really helped me. So having, you know, spent a year working uh, with victims um, at a shelter before I started my PhD, it was, you know, gave me the coping mechanisms, I think, and those strengths and, you know, ability to reflect on things, I think a lot better than it would have been had I not had that experience. Um, because NGOs are very victim centered, they're very, you know, pro mental health, um, and things like that. So I definitely use those tools going into conducting a lot of these interviews. Um, but it's been interesting too, because now, you know, I have this lab with the students. And so I've had to kind of take those mental health issues and integrate them into my lab. So I'm, we're in the process of like writing a manual on how to work in my human trafficking research lab and mental health issues is one of the issues that we're talking about. So for me, it's interesting that I learned that working on the issue and now I've had to teach my students it too, because, you know, they're looking, the data that they look at is is difficult, right? You're looking at child pornography cases and you're looking at rape and sexual assault cases. And that's really, really difficult stuff um, to, yeah, to work with. And so, yeah, so mental health is something we definitely prioritize in the lab. It's something that I learned working um, in different shelters. And sometimes you just need a break from it all and to take a day or two or a week or however long you need to be able to kind of come to terms because these stories are difficult. But I think the students, especially on the with our work on the task force, they see how vital it is and how important it is. And so that also, I think, is something that kind of keeps us going through this very difficult work. Right, right. Thank you. And I'm, and I'm sure your students appreciate your, you know, your very holistic approach, you know, which is, which is really, really important. Great. Um, and so your book, Diffusing Human Trafficking Policy in Eurasia, examines how anti-human trafficking policies in the Eurasia region have diffused from the international to national level policymaking. So uh, what can you share about some of the best practices and the challenges you identified for anti-human trafficking policy, specifically policy that is gender responsive? So this, when I was thinking about this question, I was like, oh, how do I synopsize a 300 page book into like three minutes? So I will do my best. Um, but I think the most important thing that I focus on in the book is the challenges that come with stereotypes of ideal victims. And so there is a stereotype of a sex trafficking victim as an underage white woman that is a victim of sex trafficking. And these stereotypes can impede different aspects of policy in the US and in the region that I study. Um, they leave victims behind who don't fit into this typology, mainly people of color, men and boys, other marginalized groups like the Roma population, especially in the region that I study, um, and victims and survivors of forced labor. Um, so when trafficking policy is made for a specific population, it tends to leave out others who don't fit into this category. And so when I advise people and policymakers on trafficking policy, I try to get them to think about the idea that trafficking exists beyond just white women being sex trafficked. It is a far more broad, encompassing phenomenon than that, which is sometimes difficult, especially when you think about it being engaged with immigration policy in the United States, which is very controversial. Um, so these stereotypes can be disseminated into policy and they undermine efforts to help all victims since many policies don't recognize men and boys and some in their early stages of policy development didn't actually include any aspects of labor trafficking. They only focus on sex trafficking. And so I try to argue in my book that public policies need to take a holistic approach to combating trafficking um, by adopting laws that offer rehabilitation services for all victims, not just one specific type of victim. And they need to be victim-centered, victim-informed, and intersectional, um, and recognize marginalized groups um, that, you know, are, as you mentioned in the opening, that are, you know, do make up a large uh, proportion of victims and survivors. And then finally, again, you mentioned it uh, in the introduction, we have to elevate the voices of victims and survivors in this movement across the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, and I think that is the most important. That's something we're working on in the task force, something we try to do with almost all of the um, policies that people advocate for in the state of Illinois, really engaging victims and survivors in this movement is so integral. 
Um, so what I found too with different aspects of policies is that most countries just make trafficking illegal. They don't actually think about, because that's basically what is required in a lot of the international conventions. But I try to argue that human trafficking policy should go beyond just criminalizing trafficking. So just making it illegal doesn't do victims you know, it doesn't do them justice. And so we need to have, again, an inclusive approach to solving the crime. Um, there are existing national programs, which are adopted every four to five years. Um, and they recognize different changes in the trafficking dynamics, but many of them have what we call sunset clauses, meaning that they end and can expire. And some countries don't adopt them again. Um, which is problematic, um, and national laws adopted through different legislatures are, can be a more enduring policy approach, but they're lesser used um, to combat trafficking. Um, also, the gender order, which again, you mentioned um, in the introduction in Eurasia. So it produces, this gender order produces gender division of labor where governments prioritize criminalization. So they want to criminalize trafficking over this victim-centered approach. So they want a police, a carceral state approach to things, and they don't actually want to spend the money on rehabilitation of victims, creating hotlines, creating shelters um, for victims. And so this is a disparity that I argue we need to remedy. Um, and then these inequalities are found not only in policy adoption and implementation, but also in different anti-trafficking institutions, which are designed to implement the policies. Um, so I have kind of, I don't know if you want to go into my recommendations, but basically I created an index, which I think, which evaluates all 15 countries in my region on what they can do. Um, so I argue for more victim assistance, a safe return policy, which means that if someone is trafficked to another country, they have, there is funding and government budgets to bring them home if they choose to come home. It's called safe return. Um, temporary residence permits are so important. Many countries don't have them, but providing victim an equalized and normalized immigration status is so important. Um, vacating convictions for victims, which I'll talk about in the second, in a second, in the context of the U.S., is so important. Um, many people commit crimes when they are in a trafficking and exploitative situation, and so having laws to vacate those convictions is important. And then internationally, I argue for referral mechanisms, and so that's basically referring victims to services and having police, social workers, teachers, anyone who could potentially come into contact with a potential trafficking victim. Um, having them trained for referral so they know, okay, this could potentially be a trafficking victim, they know where to refer them to. Um, so yeah, so that's internationally. On the state level, one thing that we're working on in Illinois is the vacator laws. Um, so stories like Centoya Brown, Piper Lewis, Crystal Kaiser have brought the need for these laws to the forefront, showing that how we imprison, <clears throat> excuse me, um, people who are victims of human trafficking in this country and how controversial the idea of a trafficking victim is in our criminal justice system. So I think we need more support for victim services, more shelters to help all victims, but we also need these vacator laws to be able to <clears throat> recognize that people are victims and sometimes they are compelled to commit crimes um, while they are in exploitative situations. Um, and yeah, I'm thinking about the carceral state and the criminal justice system in this country that, you know, doesn't really do trafficking victims justice. So, uh, so yeah, lots and lots of things to unpack here. Um, I'd also like to see more funding, yeah, for shelters, hotlines. I want to see more funding for task forces um, who can coordinate the, their responses, but many times don't have funding from the state or local level to be able to do it. So that is a really long answer to your question, but hopefully I kind of touched on the U.S. and then also international things, because I think it's important since probably most of the people are in the United States that we talk about issues in the United States as well. No, oh, absolutely. And thank you for that very comprehensive response, you know, not, not only about, you know, what, what is needed on local level, what the government should be doing and the way in which it's not just about putting these policies in place, right, but the implementation of them is what really can add to any success, um, you know, and, and also, you know, not then working against the policies that you actually put in place to have an impact, right? Um, being that counterproductive clearly is not going to have a, a positive impact for sure. So thank you. Um, so let's talk a bit about your, a bit more about your current uh, research on trafficking in, in war. 
uh, focused on Ukraine. Um, you know, how have human trafficking dynamics changed and the vulnerabilities increased as a result of Russia's war in Ukraine? Yeah, so war changes so many things. Um, my focus, my, I, yeah, the focus of my research on Russia's war in Ukraine kind of started because I lived in Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine, about 30 miles from the Russian border uh, before the war. And so this issue is very personal to me. Um, but I also want to mention that there are wars happening in lots of different places in the world. So I focus on Ukraine because I live there, I speak the language. Um, but this type of research that I do and these types of dynamics that are are happening are likely similar um, in places like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Ethiopia, Myanmar, so many places with wars. And so, um, so while my research is focused on Ukraine, there are many wars happening around the world today uh, that create similar vulnerabilities and similar push factors that compel people um, into these trafficking situations. Um, so yeah, I always think it's important to mention that. Um, so so yeah, so Russia escalated the war in February 2022. Most people know that. Um, almost immediately, we saw aid workers and volunteers reporting instances of human trafficking on the Ukrainian borders. So people fled mostly to uh, to Europe. Um, so most of them went west. Some of them actually did go east. Um, and so. Um, so yeah, so they kind of created this moral panic and things like how do we actually deal with this as a result of war. Um, and we see what we found with different dynamics is that human human beings are often captured and sold during conflict, but this the speed of and scope of the displacement of Ukrainians dispersed across Europe makes this situation very acute and kind of different from other wars, just because the proximity to Europe makes it, um, I think, more, I don't know, Europeans are more focused on it because it is something that's happening in their backyard. Um, and so the dynamics of trafficking in Ukraine have changed. So it really started in the 1990s and early 2000s with um, female victims of sex trafficking. Then um, as of 2008, uh, it moved to actually male victims of forced labor. So we saw more male victims of forced labor. Um, and then with the annexation of Crimea and war in Donbass that started in 2014, we now kind of see a, a mixture of all of those types of trafficking, um, and especially since the invasion of 2022. So there have been evidence of child soldiers used in combat as well as the forced recruitment of men and boys into the military. Um, there have been significant reports of women and girls being kidnapped for the purposes of sex and labor trafficking. Um, and so we've seen a lot, many, many reports of all of these issues happening. But of course, this is happening in a war zone. And so it's very, very difficult to understand the true dynamics and numbers behind it. Um, there also have been massive deportations of Ukrainians. And so whenever you get a large movement of people, that is kind of a recipe for human trafficking. Uh, the State Department estimates that between 900,000 and 1.6 million Ukrainian citizens, including 260,000 children, have been forcibly deported. Um, and so while human trafficking is definitely not new for Ukraine, um, the, you know, almost 7 million internally to displaced people. So these are people that are displaced within Ukraine. Um, and then almost 8 million people who fled to neighboring countries since the conflict began means that there is a huge risk for human trafficking. And again, we see this risk happening in all wars around the world today. Um, so the United Nations said that the escalation of this war in 2022 was the fastest and largest displacement of people since World War II. Um, yeah, and almost no government is able to respond to that, right? I think, you know, if something happened in a Western country in the United States, our, our governments would have equally as difficult of a problem coming to terms with this, especially when you're fighting a, a war and human trafficking kind of takes a very, very backstage to um, this issue. Also, one thing is human trafficking is a longer um, form of gender-based violence. And so we've heard a lot of reports of sexual assault um, during the war, and that is a more acute type of gender-based violence. Human trafficking is more prolonged, and we see a delay in identifying victims. So when the first part of the war started in 2014, uh, basically Ukrainian victims weren't located until 2015, 2016, because when they're in an exploitative situation, it takes time and 
there was significant lag to get them to be able to come forward. Um, and so we are now just beginning to see victims that were, um, you know, uh, trafficked in 2022. So we have a year, year, year and a half lag uh, uh, in identification of victims because many people don't realize that their, you know, situation was a trafficking situation. And there's a, a really prolonged and delay in identifying uh, victims of trafficking. So, so yeah, so that's kind of the different dynamics that we've seen. Um, and, you know, what <laughs> basically the lag I think is important. And I think that we would also see that lag if we researched um, trafficking in Syria or trafficking in Ethiopia as well. So this lag and this longer term form of gender-based violence, I think is very, very important when researching um, war. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And one thing, oh, I guess, I, so I also wanted to talk about, I was able to conduct research with uh, Latv with uh, Ukrainian NGOs on the ground in January and February. Um, and I did it through Zoom Zoom, through the power of Zoom, um, which was great, but it was really interesting. I thought that no one would write back to me, but to my surprise, I, every single NGO that I contacted working in Ukraine wrote back to me. Um, even though the, you know this was during war, they had huge power outages. I had one woman that was like on the last battery of her laptop as the sun was going down and was talking to me in the dark. Um, and so I think Ukrainians really wanted their voices heard. They want people to know what is happening. Um, and again, like those local voices, I think are what make my research um, so impactful and I think so important to to be able to talk about, you know, and raise the voices of the people that are experiencing and have experienced war. And so uh, can you talk, tell us a bit about how international organizations and local entities are engaging in anti-trafficking -traf responses during the war? You know, like, what did you hear from them? Yeah, so the local, so what what was really interesting is that when the war, when the escalation of the war started in February, a lot of the international organizations actually fled because they're not insured to be able to, you know, operate in those types of things and those types of war environments, especially when Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, was under attack. And so we actually saw a lot of local um, NGOs coming forward and kind of filling in the gaps. So there's one organization that I spoke with that ran a hotline and they were based out of Kyiv, um, they were on the right side of the river and were getting calls from the other side of the river where, you know, the war was happening. Um, and they were able to keep their hotline going. Um, one of the people that I spoke with, you know, they said they had to give the hotline, the people who answered the hotline extra, you know, mental health days and everything just because there was nothing that they could do. All they could do was listen to people tell their stories you know, about different aspects of sexual violence and things like that. And so, um, so yeah, I think that was very eye-opening to me and the fact that many of the international organizations actually had to leave and it was a lot of the local organizations uh, that stayed. So uh, basically when I, so before the, the current escalation of the war in 2022, there were 28 uh, reintegration partners throughout the country. Um, and now only 18 are still operational. Many people had to flee. Some of them fled to Poland. Um, so there's a 36% decrease in organizations that actually work with human trafficking. And so some of the organizations that had to flee, um, people said, you know, we just can't operate in this type of environment. And some of them, again, were in the occupied territories um, in eastern Ukraine. And so there's a huge reduction of support systems across Ukraine and an overload of people calling the hotlines that still exist. Um, which, again, something I kind of, you know, didn't realize uh, would happen during war. We would see, we see certain people flee, right? Certain people stay. And so a lot of the local organizations that stayed have had to step up their efforts during the invasion, despite damage to their offices. One of the NGOs told me they had to replace all of the windows because there were bullet holes in them. Uh, many of them had blow, had been blown out. They had to restore internet access. Many, many people were on their phones with like, you know, the Link, getting internet through their phones to be able to continue to talk to people on the hotlines. Um, and then, you know, hits to the power grid and vital infrastructure have interrupted hotlines, um, but they do their best to be able to kind of, you know, continue to exist. Uh, 
uh, with the hotlines. Um, they also started taking uh, like uh, messages via Facebook and Telegram, which are different social medias. Um, and so despite, you know, the staff of all of these NGOs being displaced around the country, they're working really, really hard to be able to continue to be able to help people who are calling for any sort of, you know, type of gender-based violence that is happening to them. Um, and then, yeah, so then we have also seen, so as the war has progressed, there have been uh, reports of exploitation in a lot of the occupied territories. They, they're, especially in Mariupol, which is the town in the south that has basically been virtually destroyed. Um, Russian, the Russian army or someone, they've brought in workers from Central Asia that are working to reconstruct the destroyed buildings. Um, and lots of exploitation has been involved in that. People aren't paying things like that. Um, we've seen reports of police in Spain broke up a gang that uh, ran illegal tobacco factories where Ukrainian refugees worked in poor conditions. And so again, these are a year after. And so we're first, we're starting to really see kind of the first stories of trafficking. And we're learning that like, yeah, I mean, Spain is very, very far from Ukraine. Um, and we're starting to see kind of the aspects of exploitation in the occupied territories and then of Ukrainian refugees that have fled to Europe too. Thank you. When I think about, you know, those NGOs who have managed, you know, to stay afloat on the ground and what an incredible resource that they are for, you know, those who have been impacted by gender-based violence or, or, or trafficking. I mean, they are, they are clearly, you know, undertaking efforts that, you know, we could only, you know, imagine, you know, how they are able to survive during a, a time of war and still be committed, yeah. you know, to ensuring um, that they are providing any kind of service that they possibly could. Um, and so when we talk about trafficking victims uh, and, you know, heading people having the capacity to, you know, transport them across you know, country or state lines, um, how, how do immigration laws affect human trafficking victims? Yeah, so so in the instance of Ukraine, so Ukrainians have a temporary protection directive, and so they actually are able to live legally in Europe, um, in the European Union. And so I think that has been one of the biggest aspects of policy that has helped trafficking, that has helped curb trafficking. Um, I don't think the EU had that in mind when they established the directive, but normalizing people's immigration status and giving them the ability to work legally is so important because trafficking traffickers use immigration status as one of the big reasons to keep people in an exploitative situation. And so that directive, I think we, you know, we will see, especially compared to people from other war that have fled to Europe from other wars and conflicts, we will likely see less exploitation um, with Ukrainians because they do have that normalized immigration status. Um, in the U.S., immigration, I mean, is very controversial, but it's definitely used to keep people in exploitative situations, especially people that are trafficked um, from other countries to the United States. Traffickers often use it to threaten and coerce people um, to, con to keep them to continue to work. They will say, I will call ICE on you. I'll call the Department of Homeland Security. You'll be deported unless you do this, right? So um, our immigration policies, in a way, in the U.S. can sometimes facilitate aspects of human trafficking and keep people in a coerc coercive um, experience because of the laws that we have. And because also, I mean, we do have a human trafficking visa. It's called a T visa. So if you are a victim of human trafficking, you're actually able to stay in the United States and have a normalized um, immigration status. But most people that are trafficked to the United States don't know that. Um, and so, and in fact, a lot of the T visa applications are kind of stuck in limbo. <laughs> um, and so people aren't always approved. So there's lots of problems problematic aspects of it, but our immigration policies in a way can help facilitate aspects of human trafficking because they keep people in those exploitative situations and make them fear police, right, when sometimes the police could actually help them in a trafficking situation. Um, and so I think we always need to think about how our immigration policy can kind of guide things and hopefully maybe how we can make it better. Um, also, that's why I, I believe the U.S. government focuses more on sex trafficking than they do on labor trafficking, because labor trafficking engages immigration, which is very controversial. And so um, 
lots of people don't want to think about that, you know, the people picking vegetables could be trafficking victims. People, you know, cleaning hotel rooms could be trafficking victims. It's much easier to paint it as people being sexually exploited or underage girls being sexually exploited than it is to think about the person who, you know, picked the vegetables or made the tennis shoes that we wear or mined, you know, the um, different uh, minerals that go into the batteries in our cell phones. And so it's a complex issue. But yeah, immigration policies often, um, I believe, facilitate trafficking and keep people in those coercive experiences uh, for longer than they would if, um, yeah, if we if we didn't have such stringent immigration policies. Yeah. Just a just a very very complex issue for sure, um, and you talked just a bit about the fact that you know those stereotypes around trafficking still exist. You know, not just in the U.S. but you know clearly around the world. But you know those, you know they're very problematic. Those stereotypes and the tropes around sex trafficking. You know that the U.S. media certainly promotes, um, and uh, you know. Uh, anti, there is a current discussion in the anti-trafficking movement on the Sound of Freedom film that was released earlier this month. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of these pro these problematic narratives on trafficking, the response to uh, of the anti-trafficking movement, and you know how folks like those who are joining us today can help combat so many of these stereotypes about trafficking. Yeah, so images in the movie like Taken, um, I'm sure most of us still remember Taken. My students are, have no idea what I'm talking about when I mention that movie now, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, so all of those, so Taken, The Sound of Freedom, so they're dynamic stories that I try to emphasize are for entertainment purposes. Um, but they can be detrimental to the trafficking movement as a whole. So they send a message that children are abducted or taken from their homes. And while this definitely does happen, in the U.S., victims are more likely to be trafficked by someone they know than stolen off the streets. And I think, again, that's very difficult for people to admit that, you know, it could be an uncle or a neighbor or something like that, someone like that, that could traffic your child more so than someone stealing them off the street. Um, that makes makes people very uncomfortable, especially when in The Sound of Freedom, the opening credits are uh, images of children getting abducted. So while abductions do happen, it can lead to trafficking. People are more likely and most of the victims that we see in the United States are trafficked by someone they know. Um, they also show only child victims. Um, so Taken and Sound of Freedom, I mean, Taken, I guess she's in college, so she's technically an adult, but um, they show child victims. Uh, and people that are trafficked don't believe that they fit into this stereotype. So they would see a film like that and say, well, that's not me, right? So I don't fit into that type of, uh, you know, trafficking situation. Um, and so those stereotypes that can be perpetuated in these films are very, very problematic because most victims aren't identified through raids. Um, like the ones that we see in the movies. In fact, many victims self-identify their exploitation. And so when you have movies that send a message that, oh, you don't fit into this stereotype of what a trafficking victim is, that leads to a delay in identification. Um, and people who have been exploited, the biggest people that identify them are themselves. And so I think it's important when we think about education that it has to be holistic, it has to be encompassing, it can't just focus on one type of trafficking um, and kind of, you know, promote, it can't promote stereotypes that are perpetuated in these films. Um, so yeah, so I think that's why the stereotypes can be so harmful because it, yeah, if they see the people in the movie as real victims, they won't identify that they're, they also could potentially be a victim and come forward to receive assistance. Um, and this is especially important when we're talking about marginalized populations in the U.S. that are disproportionately at risk for human trafficking, including people of color, LGBTQ individuals, people with disabilities, indigenous people, um, all of those people are not you know, witnessed in these films. And so I think that, you know, they can, again, perpetuate problematic stereotypes that just don't match what victim services agencies are seeing in the United States. Um, also, these stereotypes mean that trafficking advocates have to work twice as hard when they train people to counter this misinformation, right? So I cannot tell you, so I teach a trafficking class every single time students bring up different films, right? They bring up, oh, well, what about this? What about this? Right? And I spend like the first two weeks talking about, well, 
no, that doesn't, you know, exactly fit this. This is why it's problematic. Um, and so a lot of these films, they can raise awareness, but they raise awareness to a certain type of trafficking that isn't always what we see in the United States. Um, also, I did watch the film, um, the rescue dynamics that they have, they go in with like guns drawn, lots of police, lots of cops. Um, that can do irreparable harm to people who have experienced violence, have experienced a trafficking situation. And so, yeah, witnessing that just made me so uncomfortable because I cannot imagine how much work the trafficking advocates are going to have to do to be able to rehabilitate someone after a raid like that situation. So, um, so yeah, and I think that there are things that people can do. So one thing that I found interesting in the film is at the end, they asked people to buy um, more movie tickets for people. Um, I would counter that and say you, you could donate to your local human trafficking shelter. Um, I can put a list, there actually is a list, uh, Polaris did a list of local human trafficking shelters. So you can type in your zip code and find your local trafficking shelter um, and be able to donate, you know, to help uh, the people that are working to counter the misinformation that is purported in these films. Um, and then, you know, as you will talk about, like advocating for better laws and policies that will actually help human trafficking victims, I think are so important. These films are interesting. They're dramatic for entertainment purposes, and we shouldn't use them to inform our um, yeah knowledge of human trafficking at the end of the day. Also, one thing that uh, has been evidence, so there was a, um, the National Survivor Network posted a uh, uh, basically an editorial or an op-ed um, from survivors and many survivors upon criticizing the film have received threats. Um, yeah, from which is interesting. And so, yeah, so we need to make sure that we're always advocating for survivors that we're not further marginalizing the survivor voices that we hear because not all survivors can tell their story. And by criticizing people who have lived experience with trafficking based on their critiques of the film can also be something very, very problematic. So victim-centered intersectional approach is what I always advocate for. Um, and sadly, these films don't show that, I believe. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. It's really important. And I think along the same lines of that, um, in talking about sort of the, the recognition of how this could be happening in your in people's own communities, you know, what are the, you know, what, what can you think of are the, like the, the, the three standard things that someone, you know, should look for in their own communities in order to, you know, perhaps identify that this might be taking place? Yeah, I mean, just because human trafficking is not a one, like every single victim is different. Every single victim has a different exploitation story. Um, one thing I do when I do train people is I talk to them, especially teachers, because I'm an educator myself, right? I get them to look for differences with how students and people act, right? How perhaps they dress, maybe they have new cell phones, things like that. Uh, or maybe they, you know, talk back to you more than they did at the beginning of the semester. Um, really, kind of changes in things can get you to identify if someone is in an exploitative or abusive situation. Um, so really kind of paying attention to your students, um, being, yeah, recognizing that these types of things can happen. Um, one thing, again, when I talk to teachers, so the average age of entry into exploitation in the U.S. is like 12 to 14. And so we're talking about middle schoolers. Um, and so I think that, yeah, recognizing that it can happen in this country is very very important, um, recognizing that um, anyone can be exploited, that they don't always fit into victim, you know, these certain victim stereotypes, um, and kind of looking and listening to students and looking for things um, that could potentially be, you know, a red flag. So yeah, so newer clothes, things like that, all of them could emphasize that someone is in a like pimping or exploitative situation. Um, when I always tell my students to do this, when you're at a hotel, right, talking to the people who are cleaning the rooms, right, when you see roofers near your home, talking to them and saying, you know, kind of looking, are they willing to talk to you? Um, can you bring them water? Do they have water? Do they take breaks? Things like that. All of those things, like none of this means, yes, that's a trafficking situation, but I think it's a whole like holistic approach of looking at hmm, something seems weird. And it might not be trafficking, right? It might be other forms of exploitation. But if you see something that you think is odd, I, I will post the human trafficking hotline number in the chat. Um, 
when I'm done. Uh, and yeah, call the number and just ask them because many people will report similar things and then they will send those on to police or local service providers. So if you think something is odd, you can definitely call. Um, don't intervene. I always tell people call the hotline. If it is an emergency situation, you call 911. Um, but again, like, yeah, if something seems odd, if you see people at your local restaurant that are taken there every day and work 12 hour shifts and they're there every single day without a day off of work, again, might not be trafficking, but could be an exploitative uh, situation or, you know, yeah. So, so yeah, so all of those things, that's probably not a great <laughs> explanation, but I think the variety and hopefully kind of what I've emphasized is that trafficking doesn't fit one type of, you know, one type of story that mm. trafficking happens to a wide variety of people um, and can happen really to anyone. And so it's important to know, kind of, you know, recognize things and also know that they don't fit into one, one sort of stereotype. Thank you. And, and I think it's important that you mentioned that the sex trafficking itself, you know, takes place in, you know, starting uh, on average, the average age, right, is like 12 years old. We're talking about middle schoolers and, you know, sex trafficking education in public schools is certainly something that, you know, one would think would be taking place. So, um, you know, just quickly, what is your opinion around how effective sex trafficking education in our public schools actually is? Um, I mean, I would definitely say training social workers and teachers is integral because they are on the front lines of identification. Um, in certain states, they they do have uh, laws for training middle schoolers, high schoolers. I think it's good. I don't think, I think a lot of advocates are always afraid it's going to replace abuse and sexual assault training. I think it can be, you know, put together with those types of trainings um, because human trafficking does differ from other forms of gender-based violence, but there are similarities in identification. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm all for training people because again, if victims are the main identifier, if former victims are the main identifiers of their exploitation, it's important that we do education to be able to identify more um, victims. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dean, for this amazing, um, informative conversation around human trafficking. It really is important. And I thank you for elevating and lifting up so many of the aspects, you know, that our, that our audience, you know, may not have known about, that I may have not have known about, and really bringing forth the importance that it really is a complex issue and that, you know, there are things that we can certainly do in order to, you know, expand our knowledge of this really important issue. You know, I think that, um, you know, as it, as it plays itself out, unfortunately, you know, not only in our own country, um, but across the world, also acknowledging so many of the parallel ways in which it impacts, you know, vic victims and survivors, you know, no matter what country you're in, you know, no matter where you come from, is also really important as well, you know, and I think that, you um, you know, it is an issue that whether you're talking about, you know, the misrepresentation and the stereotypes in the media or films um, is something that uh, we would certainly want everyone to educate themselves um, about more. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn to uh, Megan Cassell, AUW's uh, Senior uh, Director of Policy and Member Advocacy to give us a quick update on federal and state policies regarding human trafficking. Thank you, Gloria, and, and thank you, Dr. Dean, because I really appreciate hearing your, your perspective, or say, in the trenches and, and having that real experience working with, um, with individuals who have been victims of, of human trafficking. And what I'm going to do is really just take a very brief moment to provide a bit of an overview about from a U.S. perspective, what kind of legislation is um, provides provides an approach to how the U.S. government is is looking at human trafficking, and the the main piece of legislation at the federal level is the Trafficking Victim Protection Act, and this was the first comprehensive federal law to uh, to address trafficking in, in persons. It was a reauthorized about five times, most recently in 2019, with strong bipartisan support. 
for. And the approach is three pronged. It's really focuses on prevention, on prosecution, and protected protection of victims. This is not without its flaws or gaps, as Dr. Dean had had noted. That and one of the the challenges and and benefits is that the U.S. does take a multi pronged approach, and that responsibility for human trafficking is really spread across quite a number of different agencies, including Department of Homeland Security, uh, including the FBI, the Justice Department, Health and Human Services. So we see an, a myriad of different departments that are engaged in different aspects of uh, both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. But as Dr. Dean pointed out, there are complications, for example, when we're referring to labor trafficking, and Department of Homeland Security, what, what that all comes along with it. So that's the foundation at the federal level. And there is a lot of work being done at the state level. There were, I, I double checked, there were more than a thousand bills this past year introduced at the state level on various aspects of, of human trafficking. And they really run the gamut from protection of, visit, of, protection of uh, victims, and prosecution and prevention. I just want to give a bit of a shout out to Washington State that in 2003, they were actually the first state to criminalize human trafficking. And since then, we've seen every, every state establish some kind of criminal penalty for traffickers uh, seeking a profit from forced labor or sexual servitude. I think there was a, a question in the chat earlier about what folks can do, what, what AUW branches can do, what what individuals can do. And, and I just want to highlight a couple of things that AUW, AUW is doing around the country, that there are branches in almost every state who are holding forums, who are bringing in experts, folks like Dr. Dean, folks like who are work, folks who are working either in academia and research and victim services, bringing folks together to help raise awareness of the local impact of human trafficking. So we're we're seeing this in, in California, in Florida, in Pennsylvania. Um, it is happening in your backyard, even if you don't see it. So raising awareness that this is an issue that's happening all the time, all around us, is incredibly valuable and incredibly important piece that we can bring to our own communities. I will mention that one of the challenges and that one of the things I'm not talking about is what are the statistics in the country because there are statistics of how many how many calls and tips are coming into the national hotline and yet as Dr. Dean pointed out so much of that is self-reported and it's really a tremendous underestimate and tremendous undercount of how much uh, of the real impact that is happening just a couple of other shout outs just as an example uh, in Florida, just this past year, in May, there was a bill that was passed that would require would require training for law enforcement officers to help in identifying and investigating human trafficking. But two years ago, uh, the state of Virginia actually actually did pass a law that Dr. Dean was referring to about expunging the criminal records of sex trafficking victims. And that's definitely one of the, the, the barriers that we see. And we continue to see my branch in Alexandria continuing to have a human trafficking intervention team and looking for different ways that they can continue working with, with police and victim services. In, in New York, we've seen our, our members working with um, coalition partners to really look at critical gaps in the state laws and looking for a increased accountability for Traffickers, I hate to use, I hate to say this, like traffickers and buyers is how this is referring. And the fact that we are still have to use that language of slavery today reminds me of how real this is because this is happening to people all around us. I'm not giving you an overview. I'm not getting into all of the bills around the country, but I do just want to give a couple of highlights that there is progress. There are a lot of gaps uh, between the federal and, and the state laws. 
we do need to do better. So from a policy perspective, there still is a lot of opportunity for us to be working with folks who are working directly with, with victims of human trafficking to learn from their experiences, to have that da data informed policy. And that's what we want to do, want to continue doing. And at the local level, that is one of the best things that people can, can be doing to help raise the visibility. So with that, that was a just, Gloria, a super brief uh, view of what's happening on the policy aspects and what more we can do. Thank you so much, Megan. And I think that, you know, folks who are looking for any additional information about uh, AAUW's activities can uh, be in touch with you. And I know that you and the team would be happy um, to connect with them. So I want to thank both you and, of course, Dr. Dean for sharing her valuable insight, knowledge, and time with us this afternoon um, for such a great conversation. Another reminder that the recording will be posted on the AUW website and on our YouTube channel as well in the next week or so. I want to thank the AUW staff and team that were behind the scenes uh, helping out today uh, with support. Uh, Dr. Dean, I'm going to give you the last word, but I also want you to know there's a question about whether or not uh, you, know, you might be interested in presenting some of this incredible information and research uh, to our local AUW states or branches. So we will um, definitely uh, make sure that uh, we connect you with those who want, who may want to have further engagement with you. So thank you very much. And I want to give you the last word of anything that you'd like to leave our um, participants with. Yeah, thanks. I yeah, I would love. I've talked to our local branch here in Decatur, Illinois. Uh, shout out to Decatur. Uh, it's our <laughs> AAUW branch here. I've spoken to them, uh, and I'm always willing, especially if you're in Illinois or Indiana. Iowa is a little far. Uh, Wisconsin, maybe. Um, I'm always willing to come and talk to people. Uh, but yeah, I guess my final two things are number one, uh, if you have survivors in your community, you can also invite them uh, to your local branch to be able to elevate their voices. Um, and if you can, please compensate them. Um, they come from an exploitative situation. And so if you're able to invite a local survivor to come and speak to your branch, um, that is great. Please make sure if you can uh, to be able to compensate them for their time to not further uh, the exploitation. Um, and then the last thing is um, Megan posted the human trafficking hotline, but I think that's so important. It's 1-888-373-7888. So if you think you have, um, you know, encountered a trafficking situation or encountered a victim of human trafficking, you can call that hotline um, and they will give you directions on uh, what to do and, and notify local law enforcement. So thanks so much to everyone who listened. And yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to share my research and share my knowledge on human trafficking. We appreciate your knowledge and expertise. Thank you and thank everyone for participating in the conversation today. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate you pointing out what folks can do in their local communities. Thank you.